All right, let's begin. Welcome to our three-part lecture series uh, presented by Israel Investment Advisors in collaboration with the American Society of the University of Haifa. We're calling this series from digging up to starting up to scaling up. And we, from 3,000 year old casks of wine, which is what our discussion today is going to be about. Um, let me just introduce myself for a minute, Israel Investment Advisors, and talk a little bit about the program over the next three weeks. Um, my name is Brian Friedman. I'll tell you about myself and our speaker today in one minute. I'm the president of Israel Investment Advisors, LLC. Today, we are very honored to have Professor Ayelet Gilboa. She's going to talk about the rise of ancient Israel, another view of the luxury uh, trade in the state. One week from now, a uh, senior guide, Amir Wilensky of the Hecht Museum at the University of Haifa. And then session three, we're going to have Professor Emeritus Benjamin Bental, an economist at the University of Haifa. Um, by way of introduction, most of you or many of you may not know about Israel Investment Advisors. We're one of the very few ways that American investors can access the Israeli stock market. We have been managing the Israel Investment Fund for accredited investors and institutions for the last 10 years. And we make our services available to manage pro-Israel endowments and personal assets of our clients. We are a subsidiary of GHP Investment Advisors based here in Denver, Colorado with $1.4 billion in assets under management. We are very proud and honored to partner with the American Society of the University of Haifa. The University of Haifa has graciously allowed us to showcase three of their very distinguished professors and professionals and today we're going to hear from Professor Ayelet Gilboa. She is very well known in the archeological field, particularly in the area of biblical archeology. span She has been a professor at the University of Haifa and the director of their Zinman Institute of Archeology. span She has 40 years of uh, archeology span experience as a field archeologist, and she is going to uh, introduce to us today many of us the, for the first time, what the ancient world looked like in biblical Israel, particularly with a twist on the economic story. As I mentioned, my name is Brian Friedman. I am the president and co-founder of Israel Investment Advisors. I have 30 years of experience as a portfolio manager, investment analyst, and economist. And I'm one of the very few Americans that has for most of those 30 years been focused on the Israeli financial markets and economy. I now turn over the program to Professor Gilboa. You will have an opportunity to ask questions. You can send them through the chat function or the Q&A function, excuse me, um, and we will monitor them. Uh, and at the end, we're gonna make some time for your questions and answers. And of course, Professor's Gilbo Professor Gilboa's presentation will be in English today. So I turn it over to you, Professor Gilboa. Thank you very much. Thank you, Brian. Can you hear me? I just need a constant feedback. We are gonna, we hear you just fine. Okay. Uh, thank you, Brian and Amy. Uh, I'm very glad to be in uh, Colorado. Um, I have a long presentation, so I think I'll just get to it instantly. Um, let me just say that I especially thank Brian because the economic okay. twist he asked me uh, to try and formulate actually uh, made me prepare totally new lectures that I've never ever given anywhere. So this is the first to me and I hope it works. We get and a world premiere. We'll tell the University of Haifa that this is a world premiere. Definitely a world uh, uh, pre uh, premiere. So I think I'll uh, uh, just start my presentation. Let me just make sure that you can uh, uh, see it. Can you? Yes, Brian? looks great. Looks great. Yes. 
Okay, so just a few words about, uh, about myself, and this sort of connects to the, uh, our topic, to, uh, topic today. Uh, I have been really working in Haifa for several decades, too many, uh, uh, apparently. 40 years in archaeology sounds terrible. Um, and I've been dealing mainly with coastal sites. Uh, firstly, and mostly with the site you see now in, a picture, in the picture, Tel Dor, uh, which is situated about 30 kilometers uh, south of Haifa on uh, the Carmel coast. And another uh, uh, site, uh, this is this, that's the blue logo. And another site called Chikmona, which is actually within Haifa on the southern outskirts uh, of Haifa. So my perspective of biblical archaeology is mainly a, a coastal per perspective. And you know, we are a, a university in a coastal town, so it all uh, ties together. And it ties also with our topic today, because uh, as, um, as I will be uh, showing most of the luxuries uh, in ancient times actually came uh, from all sorts of overseas uh, locales. So the sea has a very important, is a very important factor uh, in the talk today. So um, this is really another view of the rise of ancient Israel. My main uh, uh, purpose today is to see how the rise of the state in Israel and in Judah mostly in Israel, less so in Judah, because Judah was all, also uh, uh, always a more remote and isolated kingdom. So Israel is the main star in our story today, but we will not uh, neglect Judah, how the rise of these two states affected luxury trade uh, 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 in the Mediterranean. And if we have time enough, how uh, the trade was affected, how the trade was affected by uh, the state and how the states were affected uh, uh, by the trade. So just as a very general, for general orientation, these are Dor and Chikmona, the University of Haifa is here up the Carmel, so you can see it's all in there. Very short distance, I don't have uh, to drive far to deal with those sites, and, and I live, by the way, on a very small, uh, in a very small town called Zichon Yaakov, which is five kilometers to Dor, so everything is very convenient. Uh, I will be talking about three distinct periods, maybe just again to give a general uh, chronological and historical framework to our topic today. I will start with a background describing the Canaanite world, and actually its collapse, because this is a uh, important as a background. Then as the second stage, I will move to the era of the uh, states, mainly Israel uh, and Judah. I'll be mentioning also other states uh, in our region. As you can see, there's a 300 years gap between two uh, uh, these two periods. And in our talk today, we will talk about the in-between period what happens after the collapse of the uh, uh, Canaanite world uh, and before the emergence of the territorial national states of Israel and Judah, because uh, this is the formative uh, period and our main focus uh, uh, today. So just a very short brief on the Canaanite world. Our small Canaanite, Canaan, as you can see, uh, between two huge cultural regions or empires, if you will, uh, was divided into many, many dozens of small kingdoms or city-states, uh, as uh, we call them, which uh, we know well the Canaanite culture is really known well also by uh, 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 written records, by endless excavations. You know, Israel is probably the most excavated place per capita in the world. Uh, so we know the sites, you can see some of them, probably most of you heard some of these names, Lekish and Chatzor and Megiddo, we know the sites, we know the palaces of their kings, I'm not showing everything. We are well acquainted with the Canaanite religion, but again, both through uh, historical records and, uh, and archaeology. Uh, I'm not sure you're seeing what I'm what I'm seeing, but there's the list of the Canaan gods down here. Can you see it? Because uh, no, because this I have it concealed. Can you see it now? 
We can see it. It looks great. Main deities. Can you see it? El, Baal, Anat, Ashtar, yeah. Tatu. <laughs> So this was a world, a, a polytheistic world, many, uh, uh, many deities. We know them again through archaeology. What happened to the presentation now? Just a second. Can you see it again? Yes, yeah, but it looks great. Really nice. Something is stuck here. Just a second. Professor Gilboa, while you fix that, one of the themes I think you're going to talk about is the tremendous archaeological evidence for the existence of the uh, Kingdom of Israel, the Kingdom of Judah, and some of the corroboration of how the Bible describes the general arc of that history. Correct? Yes. Uh, I'm actually, I, let's see. If that's, a, that's not a, pos a terribly positively yes, if we have time. Because okay. I really want to uh, concentrate on economical, economical issues as you asked for. Okay, presentation uh, resumes. So, as I said, uh, we know the Canaanite culture well, uh, especially for the purposes of our talk today, it is uh, 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 important to note that our small Canaan in this period is part of a larger Mediterranean world and cannot be studied in isolations. In isolation because the end of the Canaanite period, the Late Bronze Age uh, 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 period, roughly the 13th, mainly the 13th century BC, the, this is the very end, sees intensive context, in, especially in the Eastern uh, basin of the Mediterranean, but not only between today's Greece, the Mycenaean, uh, culture, the Hittite Empire, which you can see was huge, almost all of Anatolia, Asia Minor, uh, the Egyptian Empire, very important uh, cities on the Syrian coast, the Mesopotamian empires, and they were all connected by an intensive uh, commercial network, or rather networks, several, several networks, uh, mainly commercial, as you can roughly can see in this period, but also political. They were uh, uh, intensively corresponding. It was really, I call them, I, use, I, I call them the club med of the late Bronze Age. They really knew each other personally. And those contacts were mainly, as far as we can tell, conducted by the elites of this period. The palaces, the temples, they were the, mo the most um, important protagonists of, these, uh, of this trade. And the contacts were so intensive that to a certain point, I believe that can, you can uh, really uh, uh, call this uh, period, the late Bronze Age period of globalization uh, in the sense that economies actually depended on each other. Uh, we have endless records of this commerce, as I said, uh, written records, iconography, in Egyptian art, for instance, thank God for the Egyptians, they depicted everything. So as you can see in this uh, slide, these are ships arriving from Canaan and merchants coming, arriving to Egypt from the Aegean. And as you can see, everything is recorded. This was really an elite official. That was a state trade to the, you know, to the point that you can, uh, uh, can call this small polities state in this period, but it was organized and it was controlled. They were exchanging everything, but mainly luxuries. Just, you know, a random selection, gold and silver that you cannot see here, but we will be talking a lot about silver today, ivory and glass and luxurious pottery and what have you. And also, now that we have the natural sciences in our service, which is something we'll be talking about, uh, also commodities that we cannot detect, you know, a decade ago, for instance, also so forget organics, among which, as we know, resins, various resins were the most coveted uh, commodity. Again, we know it from written record and from chemical analysis, and I will be coming uh, back to that. In this respect, I must say that the Carmel Coast plays an especially important place because on the most 
well-known wreck uh, excavated you know, for decades now off the, uh, off the coast of Turkey. There was a special exhibit in the Metropolitan a few years ago, ago the Uluburun uh, shipwreck. Uh, on the ship, the main cargo was one of the main cargoes of about 150, as you can see, clay store jar. This, these are the containers of the ancient world. All of them were made on the Carmel coast. The anchors that I hope you can see were made on the Carmel coast. So uh, this ship was mainly carrying a cargo from the Carmel, and we can see also the major role of the Carmel in that period uh, through other uh, uh, indication. I have a problem with the presentation. Professor Gilboa, just to clarify, for those who are less familiar with the geography of Israel, uh, the Carmel Coast is the area around Haifa. Yes, this is, yes, the Haifa and about 30 kilometers to the south. So it's not a very long coast, but it was very important um, uh, economically. Another thing to, um, uh, which is important uh, to our discussion today is the fact that Canaan, as you can see, was dominated by the Egyptian uh, empire. They controlled the area, they taxed it. We know it from Egyptian, uh, uh, again, records and art. As you can see, this is one of the uh, most important uh, Egyptian pharaohs that conquered and ruled Canaan. We find it through dozens and dozens of uh, uh, Egyptian monuments that are being uncovered uh, uh, in Israel. So when you envisage the Late Bronze Age, uh, Egypt was controlling all these small polities that were, as I said, uh, very extensively, intensively interacting uh, with other polities around the Mediterranean. As a small aside, this is, but I cannot speak about the Late Bronze Age in Israel without mentioning uh, this super important uh, monument, the so-called uh, Israel Stele of uh, one of the last Egyptian pharaohs of the period, Merneftach. Uh, he mentions Merneftach, all sorts of polities and people that he conquered in Canaan. One of them is Israel. What he writes, as you can see, Israel is laid waste, is laid waste, and his seed is not. This is how you wrote Israel in 13th century uh, uh, Egyptian hieroglyphs. By the way, again, this is not really a pertinent to our talk today, but as you can see, you see those two sitting figures, a man and a woman. This is uh, what we call a determinative. It explains to you what this word, to which category it belongs. It it tells you that the name Israel is a name of a people, not of a city, for instance. If, you, if, if they would have written Manhattan, they would have had here a determinative of a big city. But this here, so the, the importance, again, just bear in mind that somewhere in the late century, the Egyptians knew of an entity called Israel, that they called Israel somewhere in Canaan, we don't, the problem is that we don't know exactly to which region in Canaan they were referring to. Now, all the system around the Mediterranean collapses. I wrote circa 1200 BC to, of course, the process is a bit more, a bit long, was, uh, uh, did not happen in, you know, in one day or even one year, but let's say this is roughly the date. Well, all those, this, uh, this is what happens apparently when you have a super globalized world, that everything collapses in the course of about 75 years. The Mycenaean culture vanishes, the Hittites vanish, most of the cities uh, in the Levant are destroyed, and even in Egypt, even, uh, Egypt uh, does not end, but it loses its imperial control over Canaan. So post-1200 BC, this is a totally new world. The Bronze Age, wor Bronze Age world has vanished, vanished. And when we wake up 300 years later, later, the Levant is completely different. First of all, politically. All the great powers are gone. 
And we wake up into a world of territorial states. They're not very big, as you can see. You know most of them. We will be talking mainly about Israel and Judah, but we are not alone in the Levant, as you can see. But again, there are territorial states. They are larger than the small Canaanite city-states. They have, you know, one king, Israel has, has one king, Judah has one king, Moab has one kings. Some people would call them national states. I'm not sure about that. So we'll settle for the term territorial states. And then uh, other than uh, Israel uh, and Judah that I will be concentrating on today, I want to mention uh, the series of what we call the Phoenician state, the Phoenician city states. Here it's not an one state, but again, still small polities, today main, mainly on Lebanon's coast, today's Lebanon, and then uh, uh, the Philistine states, which are again, not exactly states, but more small cities on today on Israel's uh, uh, southern uh, uh, coast. Now, from that time on, as you can say, you can see the ninth and then uh, later century, everything is more or less clear. Again, I'm concentrating now only on Israel and Judah. We know that the, in those two uh, uh, states, Yahweh was the main deity uh, worshipped. It was not probably not alone, but he was at least uh, in Israel. Actually, in Judah too, we know that this was the he was the official official deity. Some of his re, uh, his records in writing are very controversial, as you can see. Uh, here we have a Yahweh with his Asherah and Yahweh of Taiman, but this is not our concern today. Uh, it's clear that uh, uh, this is the main deity of in Israel and Judah. We know the kings, you know, I'm showing you, we know them, of course, through the Bible, but, you know, as people are, uh, uh, tend to be uh, historically skeptical about the Bible, most of the kings we know from the Bible are also known from external uh, uh, record. For instance, uh, Ahab, one of the major kings of Israel, is known from Assyrian records. Again, as I said, something is, I don't know, is problematic with my, okay. So that's Ahab in the ninth century. From the ninth century, everything becomes clear. Another king of Israel, Yehu, Je, how are you saying, call him in American, Jehu? Uh, again, not in a very Jehu. fortunate position, uh, uh, paying tribute to the Assyrian monarch. I'm struggling with the presentation here. I don't know what, maybe I should be using my mouth. Excuse me for a second, maybe, maybe the mouse will do the trick. Uh, and during the ninth century, we also, this is one of the most important discoveries of when I'm looking from my mouse. There, thank you. Uh, uh, one of the most in, uh, important discoveries of the last century, probably in Israel, is again a stila, an Aramean stila in this uh, uh, case, uh, mentioning the house of David. In the Professor Gilboa, two things. Will you just tell us what a stila is? And then stila is maybe what, just so a little a, bit of, oh, I'm yeah. sorry, go ahead. This is a stili, a monument, a flat monument on which you write and depict whatever you want to depict. That's a stili. So as you can see, this, this thing here, from uh, Dan mentioning the House of David is a part, it's a fragment of a stele. Who would erect a stele? Uh, kings, mostly, but for instance, if you were in Egypt, also, you know, other officials, lesser officials, but usually kings, almost. And so, there's a usually, it's usually bragging and it's publicity. It's, yeah, it's a combination of publicity and actual historical rec uh, historical recording. So you can actually, usually we know when you set a, a, a stele in a city, for instance, this is some place to one by an Armenian king, at Tel Dan in northern Israel, usually, you know, you, can bra you cannot brag too much because, you know, people know what has happened. So, so usually when you place a stele in a specific place, usually 
the historical uh, information uh, is dependable. And just one quick question we got from uh, the audience. The Bronze Age collapse, was there, do we know the reason why society collapsed? Was it plague or uh, what happened? That's, this is another uh, lecture, but generally. First of all, surely there's an, uh, an environmental uh, story here, here, because we know that this, around this period, there was a very uh, uh, cold and dry uh, episode, probably, on, probably a, a, a global one. Because for instance, even in the Americas, uh, around 1200 BC, there's a, a, a dry period. But uh, there may have been other factors. I'll be mentioning one of them, the so-called sea people. You have to imagine that you know, when, a, when a world, when a global economy collapses, you know, people are looking for new venues of uh, subsistence and they're moving around. You know, it's a whole domino effect. Uh, again, as I said, climate is probably an important uh, uh, catalysator for the for this process. But this is yeah, this is apparently you know the uh, the danger of uh, globalization. So when you talk about Israel and Judah from the ninth century and on, as I said, everything is clear. We know the cities. I'm showing you mainly Israel and not Judah because Israel is much more impressive. Uh, you know, with city walls, with uh, elaborate water systems uh, for a period for times of siege, with public uh, economical facilities. You see my cursor? Can you see the cursors? Yeah. You see the cursors. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. storerooms and granaries and stables and more, all in the public domain. This is public, this is public economic uh, activity. I'm showing, my, I'm showing mine from door. It's very badly preserved, as you can see, but it has the best view of uh, any uh, uh, administrative building uh, in Israel. They had the society, I mean, the administration was a lit uh, a literate uh, uh, society. We know of right taxing and inscriptions on store jars used to collect taxes. This, by the way, mentions this is from a site called Rehov, as you can see in the Jordan Valley. Uh, uh, most of the in in inscriptions mentioned Nimshi. This reads Le Nimshi, belonging to uh, Nimshi. If some of you know your Bible, the Nimshi was the father of, or grandfather. The, or let's say there was a Nimshi who was a father or grandfather of Yehu. It may have been his family. Uh, controlling the Chov uh, in the Jordan Valley. I am stuck again. Let's see. No, the mouse doesn't help. I don't know. Another form, another, this, these are uh, actually receipts found in Samaria, uh, receipts uh, recording the, recept the uh, uh, receiving of taxes. So for instance, let's just make, you see all the names uh, Israelite names, they, they uh, end with the uh, Theophor, we call it Theophoric. I mean, that's the abbreviation of the name of the God, Abed Yo. Yo is the uh, 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 Yahweh in an abridged form. Uh, by the way, in Israel, it, it was Yo, and in Judaism, uh, it was Yahu. You know, all names uh, ending with Yahu, you know some of them. Uh, here, for instance, it records the uh, receipt of nevel, which is some sort of container, yan, which is abbreviation for yain, wine. This is where I connect to your wine. Yan yashan, old wine. A container of old wine was received by this person, gadio, uh, in this case. We know seals and sealings of kings, mentioned in the Bible. This is something new from 2016, found in Jerusalem, as you can see. And we know the uh, administration, I mean, there are hundreds and hundreds of seals written in Hebrew, ancient Hebrew, this is what you see, uh, of you know, all the officials of the kingdom, Netanyahu and Yozniyahu. And I would like you to, to remember this rooster because if I have time, I'll come back to the roosters. Uh, and even women in the administrations, Madana, daughter of the king, that's the symbol some of the, you may know from the half a shekel, 
Another one, Aliana, here in the Hecht Museum, there are a few seals. Actually, if I have time, I'll show one. So really, the administration, I mean, you can actually, see, you can see the state. Uh, first that I want to uh, uh, emphasize is the fact that in Judah, we also have an exceptional system of a weighing, which is composed of weights and very, very small for that matter. Now I'm going to do this exercise to see if I can actually show you such a weight. Let me uh, pause the, my sharing. Okay, wait a minute. How do I do that? I pause, can you still see me? Yeah, but it's small. Yeah, I'm trying to see, wait a minute. Okay, I think I'll do that in, do this in the end. I'm trying to stop sharing, but it doesn't let me. Okay, let's go back to the presentation. I'll show you the actual artifacts later. Okay. Are we back into the presentation? Um, in the lot, okay. Can you yes. can see the weights? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So I'll show you later on, we'll see the in vivo weights. What is important about these weights, and this is where I start to connect to my actual uh, uh, topic, is the fact that they are very, very small. The standard, uh, uh, the standard is the one shekel, shekel not as today, not as a, uh, a shekel as a weight unit, which is, as you can see, a very small weight unit. This is the standard. And then you have, we'll see, we'll see them later, two shekels and three and four and five, and then 20. But the standard weight is one shekel and you have smaller ones. You also have half a shekel. So you should ask yourself, of course, what do I do with uh, uh, weights that weigh uh, 11 or five grams? I think the, the answer uh, should be already, should be clear and I'm still stuck again with the presentation. So as I said, from 900 BC approximately, everything is relatively clear with all those territorial kingdoms. They of course collapse when they are uh, 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 conquered by the Assyrians, Israel is conquered by the Assyrians, Judah by the Babylonians, but we're dealing today with the beginning and not with the end. So the question is what happens uh, in between? Between the collapse of a Bronze Age world and approximately the year 900, as you can see, uh, when we witness those very well organized states. Now, usually this is why our topic today is something I don't think ever, anyone ever lectured about. Usually when people deal with this in between period, sometimes called dark ages around the Mediterranean, because there's no uh, um, administrations that are leaving us written records, you know, you know, Egypt, the Egyptian empire, the Hittites are go gone, no one is writing, there's no administrative writing anymore. Usually the spirit is uh, um, looked at from the perspective of um, uh, the emergence of new identities, of new peoples that eventually will turn out to be, you know, the Israelites, the Israelites and Judahites and, you know, all the people we see in the territorial states. So people are usually, you know, Israelites are, for, of course, the most discussed group. Where did they come from? How did this identity arise? And exactly the same uh, uh, questions are uh, asked, for instance, regarding the Philistines. Do they come from somewhere across the ocean? Are they, you know, some a new identity emerging, lo emerging locally? These are usually, when you, you will read about this period in the Levant, this is what you will read. And as, uh, as I said, we are going to look at this period uh, differently uh, at this topic um, uh, I announced in the beginning. And I will try to combine archaeology, of course, our main source of information, uh, the Bible and the archaeological sciences, because this, to my mind, is the most fascinating combination in the period I'm dealing with in uh, recent years. So let's start with the Bible. Can you see, I don't know, I have this thing here, I'll move it down this bar. Can you see it? 
You see something moving? No. Okay. We still see the shekels. You still see the shekels? Ah, wait a minute. So something is wrong here. So I was talking all this time and you didn't see anything? What are you seeing now? Royal Solomonic Initiative in the okay. 10th century. Okay, so let me show you what we mi you missed. Where did, ah, okay, so this is the last thing you, you saw? Yeah. So this, this we asked, what happened in between? Israelites coming, questions about the formation of the Israel identity and the uh, you know, the, you all know the narrative of where the Israelites are coming from. Many archaeologists, for instance, uh, claim that the uh, Israelite identity is something that forms locally from the Canaan from the uh, uh, from Canaanites. But again, that's not our topic today. You didn't see this Philistines, as I said, same questions. And this is our topic. So let's start with the biblical view. Basically, the Bible's percep uh, 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 perceptions regarding what we are going to talk about today, trade in luxury, is everything starts with Solomon. So I, uh, I chose three case studies uh, because they are the main case studies and also the ones the University of Haifa and me personally are involved uh, uh, with and my students. So case study A. Case study A is silver. As you can see, for the king, Solomon had, the sea, had at sea a navy of Tarshish with the navy of Hiram, he was king of Tyre. Once in three years came the navy of Tarshish bringing gold and silver, we'll be talking about silver, ivory if we have time, and apes and peacocks that I'm not going to discuss, to discuss because I cannot identify them in the archeological record. And also, uh, what we know about the Tarshish, that uh, for the biblical scholars, it was, uh, an, this is the farthest place they could imagine, because when uh, a god punishes Jonah and sends him to uh, prophesy in Nineveh, in the uh, Assyrian capital, and Jonah flees the wrath of God, he flees to Tarshish. This is, you know, this is what they could imagine, the farthest place they could imagine. So where is Tarshish? You have I mean, hundreds of books have been written about the location of Tarshish. If you ask me and you ask other archaeologists, we know where Tarshish is. Tarshish is in Iberia, in Spain, where there is a, a, a region that the Romans called Tartessos, which is one of the richest uh, uh, regions in Europe for various metals, whatever you want. I mean, there's uh, silver and gold and uh, iron and copper, whatever, and other metals. So this metalliferous region of, uh, of Iberia, it's mostly in Spain, partly in the, uh, today's um, uh, Portugal. Uh, so we have, no hesitation at all equating Tarshish with far away uh, Tartessus. So what we did, I initiated uh, a few years ago, a project led by a PhD student, Sila Eschel, you can see her, and uh, started to analyze by chemical analysis and isotopic analysis, silver found in Israel. Luckily, Israel has this amazing number, nearly 40 hordes of silver. This is a phenomenon that I can't explain. It doesn't exist anywhere in the Near East. We have 40 uh, hordes of si silver spreading over 2000 years, the second and fourth millennium, uh, first millennium BC. And also luckily for us, the Israel Antiquities Authority, I'm just waiting for the opportunity to say it, are very, very liberal giving access to those finds and sampling them. And sampling them means some sort of damage in a very small hole. Nowhere, I mean, there's no other in, uh, antiquity authority that will allow scholars to do that. We were very lucky. So we started uh, uh, analyzing all those silver hordes. And what I'm showing you now are hordes found uh, uh, in Judah. Actually, I'm showing you two out of four known for, uh, from Judah. This is from Eshtemoa in the uh, uh, Hebron, 
uh, region, and this is from Arad in the northern Negev. I will come if I have time. I'm not sure this is time is we're starting to run out of time actually. To cut a long story short, the silver in this uh, in these hordes comes indeed from Iberia. This is the first time ever anyone uh, manages to show the uh, uh, provenance of uh, uh, silver in uh, uh, anywhere, actually. The only thing is that, as you can see, this is ninth and eighth century uh, uh, silver. This is not Solomon. Solomon is in the 10th century. Now, in the 10th century, uh, there are only two hordes known to date. One of them is in the site, small site called En Chofez on the Carmel, also a very, very close uh, to here. And another one, a much larger one, uh, was discovered, uncovered the door, my site. Uh, uh, this, is this is the place where it, unco where it was uncovered above the harbor. Uh, of the city, and this is the way it looks like. And in both these hordes, they are both uh, uh, from the 10th century. 10th century, as you can see, the silver comes e either from, part of it comes from uh, uh, southern Anatolia, and part of it comes from Sardinia. So in Solomonic times, these are the sources of silver, not Iberia. I'll come back uh, to this uh, later on. Okay, study two. Uh, we're working now in another PhD uh, project on uh, purple, on uh, the origin and the production of purple. Again, I'll have to uh, 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 be, uh, let me see, yeah, no, let's try not to keep it, uh, to skip anything. Purple uh, dye produced, now we know it unequivocally today, from the murex shell, which lives, which whose habitats are all around the Mediterranean, uh, was the one of the most prized commodities in the Near East, actually in, in the ancient world. We know it because, for instance, in Assyrian records, this is also, always the third a commodity in uh, in booty lists, in tack lists, after gold and after gold and silver in this order, the third is a purple dyed textiles. And around you know in the Roman and Byzantine time, Byzantine times, only emperors could wear it on penalty of death. It was part, as you can see, uh, part of what Jews uh, 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 should have woven into their talit, into their talitot. Nowadays, everyone uses all sorts of artificial colors. No one really, although the murex is still around. And so it's very important for Jews, Judaism. It has a very important uh, uh, place today in uh, Christian liturgy. You see what? Probably, you know, this uh, tradition about uh, Jesus comes probably uh, invokes, you know, the, um, uh, the soldiers' attempts to ridicule, ridicule him on the cross, you know. Uh, putting a uh, uh, purple cloth over him. And again, in, in the Bible, you start seeing all those colors, the purple and crimson and blue, which are all produced from the same murex shell figuring uh, uh, in Solomon's reign and uh, also uh, somehow associated uh, with the uh, 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 with the connection between Solomon and his Tyrian partner, Hiram, here in, uh, uh, king of Tyre. But forever, whatever you read about purple, purple is associated with Lebanon and more specifically Tyre, because this is what you can uh, read in late uh, sources, Greek and Latin, and these uh, uh, traditions were uh, absorbed into European culture, as you can see, uh, uh, many uh, 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 drawings throughout uh, uh, the last centuries of European art showing how miraculously, miraculous, miraculously the dye was uncovered on the coast of Tyre. So when you open the, the internet, you always see purple dubbed Tyrian purple. But archaeology has another story to tell. And this is another project uh, that uh, 
uh, we actually started accidentally because we started to study this very, very small site called Chikmona inside Haifa, which we didn't excavate. It was excavated 40 years ago by the Haifa Museum. But, you know, when we just started to collect all the finds, we uh, 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 realized that the, that the uh, site, I'll skip that, has the largest collection of uh, fragments of vats, clay, huge clay vats, you know, you have to imagine, you know, Macbeth's uh, uh, witches around this, that's the way you have to um, uh, imagine this vat, stained with purple, dozens and dozens. This is a worldwide a unique find. So, uh, Shikona today is the only site known around the Mediterranean in, again, in biblical times, uh, that can actually be dubbed a purple dye production center, a facility. It's not even, a, it's also, the site is so small, it, it's a factory. Shikona is the factory for the production of purple dye. Uh, we're still debating what exactly was exported. I mean, we know that the dye was produced here, we're not sure whether they exported the dye or the, the dyed fibers or textile. The textiles, this is why we have Julie on our team. She's, as you can see, an expert on, on spinning uh, and weaving. And this is what, an, one of the, the issues we're trying to define. I'm going to skip that. Uh, and uh, the fact is today that archeologically, uh, other than Chikmona, the only evidence for purple dye production comes from the Carmel Coast and some other sites in no northern Israel, not in Lebanon. So it doesn't mean that Lebanon did not have any purple dye production, but it means that the Carmel Coast in the Iron Age, in biblical times, was apparently the main uh, uh, production region with Shikmona, this is just to show you Dor, with Shikmona being an actual factory. What we know now, and this is all work in progress, what we also know uh, regarding Shikmona, that the beginning of the purple dye production is in a very small and index, indistinct village in the 11th century. And uh, this is the way it continues to the 10th century, to biblical times. And only in the 9th century, the whole thing is enclosed, as you can see, in a fortified enclosures, enclosure. This is the minute where you can actually someone starting to control uh, the industry and I will come back to that later. Case study C. Uh, something that was again a total, a total uh, new revelation is the arrival to the Levant in this early period of spices from the Far East. Because usually people will associate, you know, spices, uh, Far Eastern spi spices in the West, in Europe, with 15th and 16th century activities of the Dutch and the Portuguese, etc., etc. This is a known story. So when uh, Far Eastern spices were uh, mentioned in the Bible, they are mentioned in the Bible, most, mostly cinnamon, every everyone said impossible. I mean, Solomonic times, connection with the Far East, this is something that you cannot imagine. In the Far East is South Asia is the only period, the only region where uh, uh, this, uh, um, these spices grew in that period. But we decided to test this uh, hypothesis. And what we suspected is a very large collection of, you see those very small they're about 20 centimeters large clay flasks, but they are very sturdy. And we could see that they were made to uh, 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 transport something, uh, a very, some liquids, some very price, uh, pricey liquids. So we uh, submitted them to uh, chemical analysis, what we call residue analysis. And to cut a long story short, and I'll uh, skip the chemistry, uh, we received a definite chemical signal uh, 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 of cinnamon. These flasks exist 
from the late 12th century through the 11th to the mid 10th, something like that. Uh, they came, we don't know how exactly the uh, spice arrived to uh, uh, the Levant, but as I said, prior to Solomonic times in the 11th, in 12th and 11th and 10th, and then, and then they vanish from the archeological records. Um, another slide I will skip. Uh, so from these uh, three cases, I'm telling you, this is something I really started to think about two or three days ago. I think there's some conclusions we can already uh, make. Let's read them uh, together. So in the 12th to 10th century, you know, our dark age, after the Bronze Age collapse and the withdrawal of the Egyptians, small scale societies, there are no states yet in the Levant, mostly Phoenician communities, that's, a, that's an, again a topic for another lecture, lecture, recuperate and in a process, process the last hundreds of, of years, reforge very long distance commercial contacts geared mainly to import luxurious commodities. This happens prior to the establishment of any territorial or national state. But when the latter emerge, and especially Israel, because as I said, Israel is always largest, the stronger, uh, the effect of these states <coughs> on the commercial networks vary and must be studied with high regional chron chronological and analytical resolution combined, and even site by site. In our case, the taking over of the coast by the Kingdom of Israel caused the appropriation of the purple production, purple production and trade at Chikmona, as we've seen, everything is now enclosed from the 10th and uh, 9th century, actually enclosed in a fortified uh, uh, factory. The cessation of those contacts with the Far East. Phoenicians are quite, uh, and, and regarding uh, uh, the silver trade for the West, uh, probably the Phoenicians are the ones who keep bringing it from the far west because the Israelites never had any uh, maritime uh, uh, tradition. So the Bible's assertion that everything starts with Solomon is something that we need to consider regarding uh, these um, uh, conclusions, but it is, on the other hand, it is cl crystal clear that when the biblical authors reported on silver, from Tarshish and spices from the Far East and purple in use in early Israel, they knew exactly uh, what they were talking about. And this is why archaeological archaeology done proper, uh, properly combining traditional methods, you know, excavating, analyzing the pottery and the stratigraphy in tradition, uh, traditional methods, but combining the natural sciences uh, also has a role in uh, debates regarding the historicity of the Bible and the dates of of the dates of uh, date of writing of its different uh, uh, books. So I think let me just uh, uh, comment that we are just starting a new project in this uh, in uh, towards again elucidating other commercial networks. This is as you can see see led by another PhD students regarding the sources of ivory. Remember the ivory from, uh, that we mentioned in the beginning of the, uh, of the talk, trying to again uh, define analytically by various methods, the sources of ivory. I mean, the, you know, they're certainly uh, 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 produced from uh, elephant and uh, hippopotamus tusks, but the question is, where from exactly? This is something we think we'll be able to define and then again, showcase other commercial networks uh, that we did not know about beforehand. So I think, I think our time is up, is it? I can continue for forever. Yeah, well, this is fascinating, but we promised an hour and um, there's just a couple of questions, Professor Gilboa. I don't yes. know about everybody else, but this was fantastic. Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah, I, I can hear you. I, uh, if there will be people who are, uh, want to stay a few minutes later after we finish, I can show because actually, as you can see, I'm talking from the Hech Museum because we're trying to, to actually show you uh, finds, but 
Uh, just to, to let everybody know, next yeah. week, next week we're going to have Amir Wilensky from the very same Heck Museum where Professor Gilboa is sitting to take us on a tour uh, virtually. And Professor Gilboa, a quick question. Yes. Can you hear me? You yes. mentioned this. You mentioned the uh, silver hordes, and those silver pieces are very irregular. So was silver used as a monetary unit? And did that lead to coins and, uh, and what we know as money? Can you maybe just give us a minute or so on that? First of all, yes, it was, they were used as currency. But uh, as you could see in the, uh, in the slides, and as I'm sure Amir was sitting here, will show you uh, next week, is it? Because one of the hordes, the Enchofez hordes is here in the Ech Museum. So he'll be able to show it to you. There was no regularity in the weight or no one could control the weight or uh, the quality of the silver. So what you had to do is with any, every transaction cut, this is what uh, we call them cut silver. And the, the biblical term would be betza kesef because you, uh, you're butzaying it, <laughs> you're cutting it with every transaction. So people had no trust, not in the weight and not in the quality of silver. So we think that in our e region, actually this hindered the <coughs> development of coins that were really invented elsewhere, not in the Levant, not even in Phoenician circles, because people did not trust, did not trust those pieces. So it took them, so here in the Levant, actually the coins developed much later. Professor Gilboa, I want to thank you very much for this very fascinating presentation and um, for all the work that you're doing for the terrific uh, people at the University of Haifa that have made your work possible and for all of the supporters and donors who have made your work and the University of Haifa's work possible. And on behalf of Israel Investment Advisors, which we are very much uh, focused on the modern economy of Israel. I find it fascinating how many parallels you've revealed with the trade of the ancient world and much, how much more international and global that trade was than I think most of us realized. And it was staring at us right in the Bible in terms of descriptions of how the ancient world worked. But with the combination of archeology span and the science, which I think we could have a whole lecture from you um, specifically about the science behind all the things that you mentioned, because I think that that would be fascinating for others as well, and a great tribute to the University of Haifa uh, in addition. Uh, thank you very much, and be well. All right, well, thank you very much. We appreciate everybody spending an hour with us. Like I said, Amir Velensky next week will give us uh, a front eye view of some of the artifacts that are at the Heck Museum, which are directly behind Professor Gilboa. And we'll uh, finish up in our third week talking about the modern economy of Israel um, with an economist from the University of Haifa. So I wanna thank you all for attending. I wanna thank the University of Haifa, the American Society of the University of Haifa, and of course, Professor Gilboa. Bye-bye.